Dobar dan, lepo pozdravljeni na prvem znanstvenem popodnevu Univerze v Novi Gorici v novem študijskem letu in tudi na splošno, ker smo spremenili format. Danes mi je veliko veselje, da lahko predstavim našo predavateljco, dr. Urš Korepnik, ki trenutno dela na Univerzi v Kilu v Nemčiji. In ker se poznava že tako dolg časa, se mi je zdel, da je, da je moram pozdraviti v slovenščino. Tako da, but uh, good afternoon everyone, now we will switch to English. Uh, so I will do the introduction and then also the, so don't worry about it, also the, uh, the lecture will be in English. So um, uh, let me introduce our speaker. So Dr. Urška Repnik, she's an expert in electron microscopy uh, applied to the cell biology problems or questions. She started her academic career with a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from the University of Ljubljana, working at the blood uh, transfusion centers where we shared the everyday problems of every PhD student probably in this world. So as a postdoctoral fellow, then she worked at the various prestigious institutions, including Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands, the Josef Stefan Institute in Ljubljana and the University of Oslo in Norway. There, the research group of Professor Garrett Griffith, who is known for his research on mapping the compartment of the biosynthetic and endocytic pathways using immunolabeling at the EM level. During her stay there, Dr. Repnik made an important contribution to the ultrastructural analysis of pathogen-containing compartments. She then moved to the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden, Dresden, Germany, as an EM specialist. There she participated in the electron microscopy research projects and at the same time partially supervised the EM facility. Currently, Dr. Repnik is the technical leader of the central microscopy at the University of Kiel in Germany. In this role, she manages technical operations and works closely with Professor Mark Bramkamp in the cutting-edge scientific research at the home institution and beyond. Dr. Repnik's commitment to teaching is evident in numerous AMBO and other practical activities where she co-organizes and teaches EM workshops and practical courses, demonstrating her dedication to foster scientific education. And as a true EM specialist, I believe uh, Urška will also share some of her broad knowledge today also with us. So, Urška, please. Thank you, Martina, for this very warm introduction. Um, I'm also very grateful for this opportunity to present my work in my home country, Slovenia. It's been in 2011 that I left it, probably for good. Uh, so again, I'm happy to be back in this very special historical location. I have um, compiled quite many slides, so I better start that we get to the end. So as Martina said, I am now leading, I'm a manager of a small facility at the Department of Biology. Um, professor Bramkamp is a professor in um, um, bacterial cell biology, and he has his own group. And the three of us, I have two technical assistants, one and a half position. We are doing the service for the electron microscopy um, project. So we have... Uh, We are home also to the confocal microscopes, so the light and electron microscopy facility, to modern confocal microscopes, and two small electron microscopes scanning an electron. So this is what we have and a lot of instruments to prepare the samples. So pretty modest, but I'm quite pleased. So why electron microscopy? It's very logical to start with light microscopy, so the benefit The advantage is that you see the bright signal on the dark background and you see exactly what you need to see, usually the, the uh, molecules of interest. But with electron microscope, you see the structural information of um, the target object as well as the reference space. And of course, with EM, we can go to higher resolution and also see the inside. Why is there higher resolution? Because the wavelength of electrons is much shorter than the wavelength of light. And here we can see this, which I like the students to remember very well, what are the resolution limits. So in light microscopy, 
uh, diffraction limitage, we go down to 220 nanometers. With super resolution, we can improve 10, tenfold. And with electron microscopy, we go in nano resolution. This I'm talking about conventional EM. This is not uh, cryo EM, which we know has nano resolution, nanometer uh, angstrom resolution. So EM is a very old technique. Everything started in 1930. There was the first prototype for transmission electron microscope. And this was um, the one commercially available in 1939. Um, it was awarded the Nobel Prize. Um, and today, this is a modern microscope. So it doesn't look so very different. Yeah, they're quite similar. The basic concept is the same. And this is the first biological object that was imaged in 1945. It was published. It was a chicken fibroblast, which is a flat cell. Uh, so we could actually resolve some structures. This is the nucleus. These are the mitochondria. And this lace-like structures, which are now known as endoplasmic reticulum. But they figured out that in order to use this microscope to observe biological specimens, they need to have thinner sections. And it took about 20 years before they really got good at preparing the samples, and then they were able to produce this kind of images. And this is what really paved foundations to modern cell biology, um, the concept of structure, function, organization of the cell, which was again awarded the Nobel Prize. I was born in 1974. And my name, Urska, is the anagram of Ruska. Ah, I was born to do EM. So um, these uh, sorry, schemes of cells that we see here or, or in this are all based on transmission electron micrographs. Yeah? But often, I think, especially students forget about this. So I think it's important to know the origin, how the original images look like, because this is very colorful, now 3D, but I can tell you when I studied them a little bit more carefully, the more colorful and fancier they are, often there are, there are many mistakes in them. For example, we know there's not just one or two ribosomes. The cytoplasm is packed with ribosomes and other organelles and proteins, not like empty spaces. So this now electron microscopy is extremely complex. I try to make an organogram. It's difficult to read from the last row, I know. But um, I am going to talk mostly about this yellow field, which is what I would call conventional electron microscopy. You can see it, the sample preparation is very intensive. There's a lot of protocols, a lot of steps. But this is this, what was already started yeah, in the 60s. Um, we just brought it over. Now we have nicer instruments. Here we see the 3D volume EM, and importantly, the sample preparation is more or less the same. Just the microscopes were elaborated to do automated serial sectioning or imaging. And then we have very modern, the last 10 years really exploding, is the cryo EM. And the obvious thing here is the sample preparation is a lot more modest. Here everything is happening. So the cryo-EM means that you are not dehydrating. Here, everything is dehydration or cryoprotection and later dehydration. Here, we are freezing the water. And we are looking at the samples in the electron microscope in the frozen state. So also, samples are always imaged below minus 160. Um, the difference is there's little sample preparation after images are acquired, there's a lot of image post-processing. So this was my entry to the world of electron microscopy. I was doing light microscopy. I was studying endosomes, um, permeabilization of lysosomal membrane. And then the next day, the cells kind of recovered. You can compare that obviously they are stained with LAMP1, which is a marker for lysosomes, but they look different. Yeah. In a way, they were larger, but they were also stained less. So it was, we were surprised. We didn't know where to go. And a very simple EM experiment just showed us that, indeed, lysosomes are very big. They are packed with material, which shows that the function, degradative function, is not 
um, going on as it should, uh, it should. and um, um, yeah, so I, um, this was opened a new venue of thinking and led to, to this, I would say even now, um, a, a new discipline on a new topic, which is how the membranes um, are repaired in lysosomes. Um, so this, what I talked about now, was mostly transmission electron microscopy. We also have um, another type of microscopes, which are scanning electron microscopes, and they were developed later than transmission electron microscopes, but are much more popular nowadays because they produce very nice images. So this is scanning electron microscope. This is a cell. This is a bacterium. You see the outside, the surface, and this is the transmission, which is the first big lesson that the students should remember. So to my students, I often say, think of the little prince when he was drawing a hat. Um, he was drawing a boa constrictor digesting an elephant, but all the adults thought that this is just a hat until he drew the inside. So when we are looking from the outside, this is scanning, and we're drawing, drawing the inside, it's a transmission electron microscope. Um, the concept within these two different microscopes is what um, electrons we harvest to make the image. Um, so common to both is that we make the image using the electron beam, and this beam interacts with electrons in the sample. This would be the high resolution. In transmission electron microscopes, the electrons have to go through the sample, and when they, when they interact, some will be scattered. Um, and so in the microscope, we will see later, they will be eliminated mostly from the image. Whereas in, in scanning electron microscope, the electrons um, that come in the beam um, produce secondary electrons, so they eject, eject project, um, electrons from the coating, the metal coating, and that will then they will make mostly the picture. It can also be the backscattered electrons. So transmission electron microscopes, the image is formed by the electrons that go through the sample, and in, and in scanning, it is coming from the surface. So this is just about how the contrast is made. This is the sample. Um, the electrons that do not interact heavily with, um, with the sample go through and reach the detector, and those that interact with, with electrons in the sample are scattered at high angles and will then be eliminated by the aperture. So this will be, they will produce dark areas. So what is dark? means it had a lot of electron, um, was electron dense. And this is again just about the scanning where it's different. We are coating samples with the metal layer that makes them conductive, but also is the source of secondary electrons. So electrons comes and they are more able to escape from pointed surfaces or from uh, slopes or slanted areas rather than from the flat. So the what we see is brighter, is where most is usually pointed, where electrons can escape better. This was a little bit of theory, and there are two different microscopes. Of course, this is transmission. Here is the sample. This is the objective lens. And then the real image is formed, whereas in scanning electron microscope, the objective lens is just um, focusing the beam. And then the beam is rastered. It goes in. X, Y, like in a confocal tube, 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 and then the computer produces the image. So now I will tell you a lot of images. I think it's been more interesting showing you images. So the first and very straightforward technique, I don't want to use the term simple because there's nothing simple in EM, is negative staining for transmission EM. So it means we can use very small particles like proteins, phages, or viruses. They are so small that the um, that electrons will still get through, and it's important that they are not dead, that they are alive, because we have to stain them. We stain them in a very simple procedure. 
Um, we absorb them on grids. We put grit on the uranyl acetate. This is the common stain, electron dense. And then we make a tiny little film. And the principle is that this tiny little film is going to be, to be blotted away, but there will be a little bit left at the edges of, this, um, of the object. And uh, the, the, the thicker the object, the more stain will stay around. So we see kind of a gradient. Of course, there is nothing colorful in the microscope. So we're going to see black and white. This is kind of the image we get. So we get our object, which is light, surrounded in a black, in a darker stain. And these are the real images of phages. I think from Martina, she herself is also studying viruses. So these are the viruses that, um, um, for, of bacterial viruses. And now we see all this dark is the layer of uranyl acetate. And here are the phages. Um, this is good preservation and this is bad preservation. On the same grid, I will find all this kind of good and bad preservation. It all depends. This is too dry, too little stain that is also stabilizing the structure of the virus um, when it's air dried. So when everything is nice, we see a lot of different shapes. Be careful, this is just 50 nanometer big um, as the scale bar. So this is very, very small um, particles and we already see a lot of interesting structures. And um, so we know that some phages have a contractile tails. So here, yeah, if we, oops, um, when the sheath contracts, we actually see that it is here shorter. This stays more or less the same, but this thick part is shorter and it thickens in his diameter. So already the simple techniques, this preparation takes 10 minutes. We can observe so many details. Um, this is was little small contribution on um, a group is doing the is um, on archaeal viruses. They are producing plasmid-borne viruses. They are making also some mutations, and then they wanted to see if the particles still look the same after deleting some proteins, and they did. So here we see that these are the full pro. Uh, particles, viral particles, and this um, have already no DNA. They always look with the dark center because the dye can go in there. It's no, no longer full. Um, it also works with bacteria, but you can already see that this bacteria look darker. We just basically see the shadow. And I find it fascinating. Probably most of you don't know. There are also predator bacteria um, they have a big, thick flagellum, they swim and they prey on um, like E. coli or pseudomonas um, and they attach to them, like we believe we see this here, the, the, this bacteria called the Lovibrio, and then they actually enter the prey cell and proliferate inside. So it's difficult to see, but you can see here there are some several cells, bacterial cells of this the Lovibrio bacterium, and they even have this flagella inside the prey cell. Yeah, here a similar one. So um, it's a very, very powerful technique. And in such a culture, then often we see a lot of dead cells. So this would be the dead bacteria, yeah, where only the outer membrane is left and the cytoplasm was extracted or used by the uh, proliferating bacteria inside. So for everything else, we need a lot more time to prepare the sample. Um, especially, so common to everything, this conventional EM, we need to fix the sample and we need to remove the water. We remove the water by replacing it with organic solvent and then for SEM, we would do the critical point drying to prevent, it's a special method not that does avoid destroying the surface due to surface tension. Um, and then, as I said, we have to coat them with a metal layer. This would be this um, golden layer, so that this will interact with electrons and produce a lot of secondary electrons. For transmission EM, it's more complicated. We have to add a lot more stain that would be selectively bind, for example, to phosphates, 
um, in the membrane or in nucle nucleic acids, yeah? And then we have to embed it in resin so that we can section it because bacteria, mm, but if you want to see inside, we need to section. And the harder the resin, the thinner we can section. So um, this is not at all high tech. This is, we are just bringing the samples from one tube to another, changing the ever higher concentration of ethanol. And for polymerizing, we have a monomeric uh, plastic is flu fluidic, and then it's polymerized with heat. Here you see the blocks, and this is a very big, unusually big um, biological material, which looks now dark because it was stained with this electron dense uh, stains. A very important part is sectioning. Here we have a special machine. It really is special. It moves forward for 180 60 nanometers only, and make these um, very thin sections, as we see here. We determine the thickness from the, in this interference color. So I like silver. This would be hmm, conditionally, they are too thick for EM. And they are so thin that they cannot be just handled by tweezers. They need the support, in this case, the surface of the water. Here you see a lot. Each of these is one section, and here I was making serial section, and I was picking serial section. Now, if I image one after the other, I can assemble a 3D volume. Um, here, I just want to show you how we... Uh -huh, may I just, it's just a very short video to show you how we pick up these sections. So we don't take them directly. I have an eyelash attached to the wooden stick. I have to push it on the, on the grid, which is covered with a plastic film, and then I slide it out of the water. Then it has to dry, and there's one more, I think. So this really takes a little bit of practice. It's not something that students can learn in a week. Usually it does take, it does take a year, and there's always something to do better, learn more. Yeah, so these are the grids that we use. They come in different shapes. You can imagine that this gets more support than the sample here. And the tricky bit is that these films are very easy to break and then you lose everything, yeah? especially with serial sections. So these are empty ones and here you can see um, the sections. This is always 3.5 millimeter in diameter, so you can imagine we cannot look at the whole elephant, yeah? in, not in one step. Um, with SEM it's very different. The samples are, can be thick, so this is a whole spider. It looks shiny because it's coated with gold. And the samples are put in a very stable aluminum stub, so there's not the danger to perforate uh, the support film. I'm always amazed I have this privilege to look at the same prep with different imaging modalities. So in this case, I guess it's scanning EM, and in this case, it is transmission EM. So we see, um, I think every one of you would, pre would prefer vote for this one, but I always say this one gives actually more information, but we need both, no doubt. Um, so we saw it's, it's tricky to get, um, so for, how do I say here? Mm -hmm. The problem with transmission EM, which, which we have to keep in mind, is that we always look at very small part of the volume. In the case of bacterium, one section will be probably one-tenth of the volume, but um, and another problem is that we are sectioning them at random orientation. Yeah? So if you have bacteria that are rods, when you section them, they will actually look even like the circular when they are, or, or, or longer elongated profiles. So something like here. And I can tell you I had a bizarre experience. I was showing in, in one talk, um, um, circular profiles and the envelope, the structure, and in the, in the break, people came to me and said, oh, we didn't know Bacteroides is a, uh, is a cock, uh, is a, um, 
is fear. And I said, no, no, it is a rod, it is a rod. And I realized that I have to emphasize, yeah, because if you're not trained to do this, you would easily thought, oh, how many diverse bacteria you have here. Um, so now we had a project with Professor Bramkamp. This was exactly about also um, changes in the shape. Uh, it was treating bacteria with antibiotics, two different antibiotics. So this is what we can see with phase contrast. Yes, we see that after treatment, bacteria have different shape. And of course, with scanning EM, we see a lot higher resolution. Um, and here you can see that something is different, something is kind of missing on the surface with this antibiotic less, with this one more. And then with the transmission EM, only very little part of the envelope is shown here. And it took a lot of optimization that we could actually see the distinct layers, yeah, that I think is cytoplasmic membrane, periplasmic space, peptidoglycan, arabinogalactan, and, uh, galactan, and then the mycomembrane, which is what is missing. So there is a difference, but um, it, it can be very subtle. It requires very careful work to see this kind of stuff. And eventually we were able to realize what they are doing. We needed also the growth curve. And then we saw that this antibiotic is stopping the growth less, um, this one, yeah, less than this one, and that's why it produces bacteria with worse envelope. That's why the antibiotic is actually more efficient, because it doesn't just stop the proliferation of bacteria, so they are forced to produce new cell wall, which is defective. Um, important lesson is when you're doing EM, you don't look just at the image. You need to know the project. You need to know the biochemistry growth curve. The more, the better. And bacteria also make biofilms, like this is um, Bacillus subtilis. Mm, my uh, Professor Bramkamp studies several mutants. And Bacillus film is, is known to have a hydrophobic layer on top. And this is formed by this by the protein BSLA. So this layer is preserved in the wild type. I was very happy I could image it. And it looks so very different in scanning, yeah? It's such a thin layer, but in scanning, it looks such like a thick blanket covering the bacteria. And so in the mutant that, we, that he produced, didn't have this layer, so it's missing in both transmission and in the scanning. I always try to use more than one method, also with EM, to be sure that it's not an artifact, because there are always artifacts. Um, so we also have, um, we do a lot of uh, work with plants. Uh, we have a very nice group. Um, they are studying, uh, it's a DNA binding protein, Verli-1, that um, regulates the transcription of the, the chloroplast genome. And uh, they have found that cells, that leaves cannot, um, um, cannot respond well to high light. So you can see the wild type and the mutant. The, the leaves look very different on the thickness. And this is the same kind of block. These are also EPON sections, these plastic sections, but they are a little one micrometer thick. Then we stain them and we image them under light microscope. This is a little higher magnification. But this is what we can see, yes? We see this is stained darker, chloroplasts look um, um, kind of uh, bigger, but at this level, and this is not even, we can go a lot higher, we see so much more, yeah? We see the starch granules in the chloroplast, so this is one chloroplast. Um, the grana would also look different at higher magnification, and in this mutant, we also see a lot of plastoglobules, which indicates wow. that there's a lot of oxidative stress going on in this chloroplast. Um, the um, complex project from complex samples, I mean, like uh, this is neonate intestine infected with enteropathogenic E. coli. Um, to study this kind of samples, we need several levels, different scales yeah, of resolution, because 
just going when I was when I started with this project 10 years ago, I just thought I will make sections, go into the microscope and find bacteria. I was imaging for one month and I didn't find any. So I needed a strategy how to find them. And again, we first make this zimifin, we call them, so one micrometer sections. And it's just about right to be able to spot bacteria. So these are bacteria. And now we can, in the EM, I, here I stop, I make thin sections, and now I have bacteria in the electron microscope. Can it be any more, can it be more beautiful than this? So we see the bacteria are colonizing the apical surface of intestinal cells. They're not internalized and uh, they modify the surface. So this is all um, polymerized actin. It's called um, pe uh, pedestals. And this is a scanning electron microscopy image from a colony of the same kind of bacteria. So really, I just encourage you to contemplate how different aspects of the very same sample you get using the different techniques. Um, Another very complex sample, this is um, a fast sedimenting um, algae culture, and uh, the, it is used actually for cleaning the wastewaters. This was first stereo microscope. Um, yeah, we noticed, okay, we saw the other, these flakes, and in the scanning EM, we saw, I can tell you, these are cyanobacteria, and we thought, yeah, like spaghetti, they are like sea urchins, you know, making... Um, um, clamping together. Um, but when we did the transmission EM images and I stained them, I said, no, 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 look at this. This is the matrix. And now the group is studying the, the role of matrix. This turns to be the clue to produce these um, clusters, these clumps that are the key to this fast sedimenting um, um, characteristic of this culture, which is very important for the wastewater cleaning. Yeah, and it, this is very beautiful. So this is a cyanobacterium, and it is colonized with this other kind of bacteria. Again, you see this is a scanning. Here you see the TEM now in cross-section. These are the thylakoid membranes in the cyanobacterium. This is the matrix on the top, and this is how the bacteria are attached. Um, we come to immunolabeling, and this is, um, I'm, it really is detective work. Um, these are the two best detectives, and I was very privileged to be there uh, in um, an, an apprentice, uh, Professor Gareth Griffiths and uh, Heinz Schwartz. So they both collectively really uh, advanced uh, immunolabeling and showed many positive examples. So Gareth also wrote a book in 1903 about um, immunolabeling with a lot of different tricks. But still, in, in 2014, when I was working with him, um, he wrote this paper and I was laughing out so much. Um, antibodies for immunolabeling by light and electron microscopy, not for the faint-hearted. It really is. You shouldn't get discouraged too easily. And this is one of the challenges, of course, which the antibodies have, Charles Darwin. So if we get this one, what's this one? It's not Charles Darwin, it's Hans Schwarz. So <laughs> antibodies have to be aware and discriminate between sometimes very similar epitopes. This was actually the lecture in Slovenia, it's in, in the Darwin year. <laughs> so. Um, I will just recapitulate very fast. So in um, whole mount, to, to introduce you to the problems, in whole mount labeling, oops, what you do is you have a cell, you fix it mildly, right, 10 minutes with paraformaldehyde, and then you use detergent to permeabilize the membrane to make a gateway, a gateways for the antibodies to enter the cell. So then you incubate with one, two antibodies, and then with a secondary antibody. And even if you get a little bit of um, non-specific staining, yeah, so still there's a lot of everything and you see nicely, of course, endosomes, what else? That's what I'm most interested in. Um, when we have on-section labeling, it means we make section from the cell. 
And um, the fixation is always a trade-off. We need relatively good preservation, so we have to fix more than we have to fix for the, immuno for the whole mount labeling. We don't want to use any detergents, but we also want to preserve the epitopes. So, yeah, the ultrastructure will always be worse than when we don't do labeling, and, um, but always more than for whole mount immunolabeling. And that means we will lose some epitopes already. And then because we don't want to use any detergents to, and we use stronger fixation to get access to epitopes, we have to section the cell. So now imagine I told you we are kind of sectioning this cell into 100 sections. And then here's the next problem. If I'm labeling, yeah, I will find endosomes in this profile taken from here, but not the one I took from down here. Yeah? So not even the structure of interest will be present in every section. Um, we don't use fluorescence, of course not, that we can't see in an electron microscope. We use small gold particles. 10 nanometers is the standard. And they can be um, they can be conjugated to secondary antibody, or we use, they're conjugated to protein A gold, but this one only recognizes rabbit, very well rabbit antibodies, so for all the, like this would be rabbit, for all the others we have to use bridging antibody. This is a detail, but it, it's different to immunofluorescence, it is more complex. Here, just to recapitulate the specifics of um, um, character, yeah, specifics and the limitations presented on the on-section labeling. Um, different kind of epitopes. Here you see you have them on the, um, uh, on the outside of the endosome. Here also in the lumen and intraluminal side. Here they're just in the vesicles. So the point is this is much stronger fixed. So the antibodies cannot penetrate in this tissue. They can also be plastic. And when the labeling is, um, yeah, here we have them also penetrating inside. And even not all, even not all um, epitopes will be labeled by gold. Why is that? Because the bigger the gold particles, the smaller the labeling efficiency. So there's steric interest, there are electric repulsion. So yeah, and so we. The problem is we don't really see five nanometers so well. One nanometer we don't see. We need additional staining um, enhancement, but that can also be non-specific, and that makes everything dirty. So it, it's it's challenging. And Heinz he he tests everything. He figured out that he just did this nice experiment. So you see, if the small um, the gold twice uh, half size of gold gives twofold more labeling. This is kind of a rule of thumb. Yeah. So these are the five nanometer, um, or four, eight, and 15. Um, and this is some of my examples. This is just the one. So we do also fluorescence labeling. Um, can, we can do on, the, on sections. It's actually very nice. I routinely use it to test the antibody specificity and to see what pattern of labeling I get with these antibodies. And so this is liver, liver tissue. Um, if, um, yeah, this is liver tissue. You see these big spaces are sinusoids and here would also be stained the sinusoids. But I was really um, um, kind of fascinated by these little dots here. This is not working so anymore, good. And now look, these dots, oh, sorry, these dots. Oh, okay, never mind. Um, yeah, here I have a peer around the DAPI. What is DAPI um, labeling? It's labeling nuclei. And when I was looking on the, uh, in the EM, I could see a lot of gold particles and they are labeling nuclear pores. So here I was using Vigerm agglutinin. It is uh, labeling N acetyl glucosamine, but also sialic acid, which is known in, uh, which is present in the pore complexes. So it's amazing that on this section we can already see now this labeling is reliable, is specific, and we can also see it here beautifully. Just 
I think that demonstrates the power of this approach. These are the bacteria um, that I've seen before, the EPEC and enteropathogenic E. coli. When you label, when they count the colonies, routinely the group, they do labeling on paraffin sections, and they just see blobs, right? Nothing. But when I do the section and label for fluorescence, uh, already with DAPI, I see individual dots. These are bacteria profiles. And this is, again, another level when I do this with immunogold. Uh, this is just um, antigen O on the surface. You can see it is labeled also um, on the side where the bacterium is attached to the cell, which is something you cannot resolve here. And even better for labeling is... Um, um, so these were all plastic sections, but even better are cryo sections. This is not cryo EM because this cryo, we will make sections by freezing the block. This is how we harden it. And then we section them at minus 80, minus 100 or even below. But then we bring them to room temperature and we can label them. So uh, here I just, this is the section you see here, interference colors. So of course, at this temperature, the water is not fluidic, so this is dry sectioning. A little bit more complicated with a lot of antistatic, but these new machines are just amazing. Um, and this is the examples again. As I said, I always do immunofluorescence lamp. And again, when the group would do this on whole mount, they would just see a blob, a blob above the nucleus. And when I try to convince them, no, 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 this, this nucleo, this salmonella containing vacuole is not a simple blob. This is a very structured vacuole. What does it mean? It has a lot of membrane, um, like um, finger projections, because it's the membrane where the bacterium interacts uh, with the host cell and produces effectors that modify its yeah, destructive potential. And sometimes we have to use, this is the only way, because these are nanoparticles that would be dissolved by organic solvents used to, for dehydration. So the is here is the way to go, and they are nicely preserved sitting in this endosomal compartments as suggested by the LAMP1 labeling. Double labeling is very, very difficult. Um, much more difficult than immunofluorescence, but it does work. And here is one example, yeah? So this is, um, I was labeling Golgi, the trans-Golgi marker, and the uh, RAB9 protein, but it had a GFP tag, so um, that was really, that, that's why it worked. And now you can see how difficult it is to see the small gold particles, only half size, the 10 nanometer particles. We can also label for SEM. This is some um, Sprangicilla bacteria on the surface of a macrophage cell. Different detector is used. So this is backscattered electron detector. Then they really glow like a Christmas decoration. And I will go a little bit extra and just show you the project I did in MPI Dresden. And this is Professor um, Marino Cerial. He is now the director of the Human Technopol Institute in Milan. Um, he is interested in liver and in endosome. Sometimes he's called Mr. Rap5, um, for all those who know the membrane trafficking. So the liver tissue is, his interest is the apical, uh, is the bile canaliculi. Why? Because they are formed by apical membrane. And um, epic, this is the bile canaliculi, so it has many microvilli. It is made by two neighboring cells, and it is very, very small lumen. Yeah? It's about half or one micrometer in diameter. Um, these are sinusoids. It's a lower magnification, and I know where to look for them, so here we would find the bile canaliculi. And when studying the development of liver in mouse, uh, what the group found is that balcanaliculi don't look like this very narrow, but they look dilated. And then they had these structures that were spanning um, the lumen. And when we were looking at them very carefully in the end, we saw this dark 
um, electron dense regions, this suggests um, it is a tight junction, so it is border between two cells. And basically, in every one of them, we saw the border. So my job then was another technique. I had to make the serial sections because we needed to see the volume, not just one single section, but a bigger volume through the bile canaliculus, and just serial sectioning, imaging, and then putting them together was, the, was a good way to find the answer. So here you see select images, um, sorry, sections, a little bit with a distance. And now you can see that these cytoplasmic extensions are present at the top, but then they disappear in the bottom part of the uh, bile canaliculus. And here we see them, they actually appear in the bottom part. So when we reconstructed everything, we saw that they have this kind of barriers that only go halfway through the lumen and start uh, connected either with the bottom or the top. And they were named bulkheads. And they are very important, like the bulkheads in the boat, they are stabilizing the structure, which is especially important during the development or in the case of impaired bile flow, which is the case in some liver diseases. And um, I also worked on with, a, with very closely with two other colleagues on early endosomes. The point there was try to localize different microdomains or nanodomains on endosomes, uh, early endosomes. So, Early endosomes are organelles, vesicular organelles, that characterized by RAP5, which indicates the tethering and fusion machinery because they um, fuse with vesicles that are formed at the plasma membrane by internalizing the cargo. And this cargo can be like nutrient receptors, like for iron, they will release iron, and then they will be taken back to the plasma membrane via the recycling pathway, or some signaling receptors will be sorted for the degradation. And um, this is how we see these different domains with a confocal microscope. This was my colleague, so she was doing confocal microscope. Yes, we see that they are not completely localized, but it's a little bit of blobs. Another colleague was in charge of single molecule uh, localization microscopy. This, this is like, um, so he can see um, much better resolution down to 20 nanometers. And he made this map, so yeah, it was a little bit better. But still, we missed the reference space, what I told you at the very beginning, um, with this Greek island um, illustration. And that's why we thought we're going to do correlative microscopy. And because it's um, super resolution, it was called super clam. So first I established, it's a very tricky project. Um, if I, I made very thick Tokoyasha sections and then I was doing tomography, another way to get the 3D volume on a, on a small, um, small volume. And then I was segmenting all these membranes to get the 3D object. So eventually what we did, we were loading all the fluorescence markers. I was cutting thick sections. Um, we were doing super resolution imaging, electron tomography, and then putting all together. So this was, I think, one of the nicest examples we got. Um, super resolution image, my image, and then we assigned on a model all together. It looked like this. So we showed this for the first time, the nano domains um, on which um, RAP5 appears. And um, so all I was saying now was conventional EM. I just got a taste of cryo EM, and that's very different. As I said, samples are at all the time in a frozen state. Um, embedded in ice, this ice is not crystal ice, it's amorphous ice. Um, imaged below, um, in, well below zero, yeah, and uh, there's a lot of computational processing. So mostly um, it's used to determine proteins, structure of proteins, and one image is not enough, right? What they do is like, sub, they, they do averaging, it means that 
they take a lot of particles, average them, and at the end, they get a very sharp image with high resolution. So we just tried this, I just saw with one um, um, protein we've often found on the surface, on, on the surface yeah, of these endosomes, and um, you can see just 11 particles give a much sharper image. So you don't just go take the image and you know what a protein is. There's, as I said in the beginning, there's a lot of post-processing. And um, I was doing um, cryo-electron tomography, so I was isolating um, endosomes with uh, magnetic isolation. I was feed feeding the cells with ferrofluid, pulled out early endosomes, put them on the grids, freeze them, and then did tomography. This is one of the sections. And this is a very conventional way, and not really a good one, but... And you can see that it's remarkably similar, right? So these are both early endosomes. Um, they both have kind of hairy membrane. Here you can see the molecules on the membrane, and here you can see them a lot, very hairy. Um, they both have... They have intraluminal vesicles here, unfortunately not preserved so well. Um, the tubules in green and this um, early, um, epidermal growth factor sorting domains, yeah, which are also, I call them always double decker buses uh, on the surface. Um, so it is beautiful, it's a lot of work, but our problem is that for averaging, we need the periodic structure, something that has a constant um, stichiometry, not something that is very variable. So it's very challenging to find the identity of these different proteins, and RAP5 would be way too small to be able to find it. So to conclude, I want to just say there are several considerations. Conventional electron microscopy is far from ideal. It requires a lot of practical skills, finger skills, dedicated instrumentation, time-consuming sample preparation and demanding image interpretation, because most of the time what we look at are artifacts. But there are, I think, for success for EM, there are two critical factors, well-defined biological questions. You just don't go there and say, oh, I'm, I'm going to find something. It's a jungle. And dedication and mindfulness throughout the workflow. Um, Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ushka. So it was uh, very interesting in, and very uh, full of information. So I think also some basic ones so that makes easier to ask questions. So now the talk is open for discussion. So please. Uh -huh. Uh, for, uh, in cryo EM, uh, I, uh, there is the problem of low contrast uh, or not? The contrast is completely different in, in cryo. We use amplitude contrast for conventional EM. Um, it's formed differently. It, you need a whole different instrumentation. So, um, Low yes, it's true. Of course, it's low contrast because we don't do any contrasting. Yeah. yeah, That's also only what is in the sample already. And that's why they also need to do averaging ah, to, okay. so to the amplify. So the solution is uh, averaging. acquisition yes. time. Okay. Yeah. But it is really about the, the proteins, right? The conventional EM is often just about the membrane. What, what structure the membrane makes? Is there a bit of electron density or not, the cryo-EM, of course, is the future cryotomography for cell biology. It will give us the, I think, molecular architecture of organelles. Eventually, it will. It will. The softwares are developing fast. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. I've got a question regarding the, so viruses or bacteria. Usually, they are in buffers. So how you minimize the effect of the buffer? You know that there is also, it's crystallized on the grid in contrast to the viruses. You just uh, dilute it or just use water or how it is. Yeah, when we attach, so we, it works with, you probably need a high titer solution, right? Then you attach viruses on this film that is covering the grids. 
it's thin plastic film, 60 nanometers. And then we quickly bring the grids over several water drops. This is how we wash away the buffer. Then we incubate for 10 seconds on UA, so, or any other tungsten acid or whatever, and then we, we blot it. It's also very important because the buffers not only crystallize, they can precipitate with um, electron-dense dyes like uranyl acetate. Um, we don't, well, it's not ideal, of course, yeah, but it, it's good enough, I would say, just to wash on, uh, we just wash on several water drops. Just tap, 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 tap. Uh, the other question is about the dyes. So you said that you use it uh, uracil acetate. Mm -hmm. Is there any other less toxic, let's say, because we know it's uranium, it's from uranium, uranium so. Yeah, it's depleted uranium, so it's not very radioactive, but I know our safety officers are very concerned about this. Um, in my experience, uranyl acetate works best, um, and I'm lucky enough to be still able to use it. Yes, there are phototungstic acid and um, um, molybdenum, I think. So, yeah, there are. But I think these lantanium alternatives, I don't think they work so well. Because what these stains do, they not only provide a contrast, they also do interact with the, bio, uh, with the biological structures, molecules, and they preserve them. This is why if the section, if the film of this dye is too thin, there will be structural poor preservation. Thank you. Also a technical question. So when you work with antibodies, what must be the minimal affinity for uh, preserving over the, uh, all the fixation or so on? And the other thing, um, what kind of functionalization do you use? So it's, uh, I mean, if you have to fix directly the gold on the, on the antibodies, it's uh, malamide uh, or cysteine with the gold? You know, I'm not so. It's um, I'm not doing this myself. We are buying these reagents from Utrecht, but it is true. Thank you for the question. I I have done a lot of colloid, colloidal gold myself, and I'm very interested in doing more functionalizations because now with all this PEG etc., it's nice to give a spacer like a PEG molecule, and then. Um, I don't know what would be best, but like one of the you suggested, the best is to try and figure out. And do you know this is the minimal affinity for um, preserving the binding of the antibody to the surface during fixation? Or this question, I don't really understand because the antibodies. Um, so what we know is the antibodies need to be in higher concentration than they are for immunofluorescence. They're usually better if you use the anti-serum rather than the purified antibody. Um, most of these, it's very important what the antibody is specific for. Many antibodies are designed for Western blotting, which is the uh, denatured um, linear epitopes. They're not going to work on something that is um, fixed. So your epitopes are native? Um, yes, I think, but they are fixed, right? It's still fixed. Um, Usually, if there is lysine inside the epitope, it's going to compromise the, the epitope. That's not going to work well. But today, I didn't talk about high pressure freezing. That usually improves labeling. It's just rather than using chemical cross-linking, um, we very fast um, bring the sample immobilized by low temperature and then bring up to room temperature by free substitution. So there are no fixatives. Epitopes usually are better preserved. It's, it's many different possibilities. Okay. I have also a curiosity. We have a colleague working with Volt, and Volt should be very present, very common in cells, no? But uh, I never seen a picture of cryo-EM with a Volt inside. So we were just wondering why never happens to see vault in the in the cells. Did you see some vault uh, structure? Uh, uh, what do you mean vault? I don't understand. It's a sort of, uh, how can you, it's not an organ, it's a, uh, yeah. 
It's a very nice shape, you know, so sort okay, of... Okay, characteristic. <laughs> and yeah. why do you say it is vault-shaped? Do, how do you know that? It's common from what method? Uh, uh, no, I mean, I never seen a picture in which, you know, see, here's the mitochondria, here's the this and the other, but never happened to see something that looks like a vault in a, in a cryo, no, I mean a cryo, in, in any uh, electron uh, uh -huh. picture. So if just by chance making your uh, sections, uh, you... No, I, like I told you, you only see, you can only find what you're looking for. Yeah, because there's so many interesting things. It's, it really is. Um, I need a biological question and I have to visualize what I expect. But the mitochondria or Golgi you can recognize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I have a very basic question. So I see the trick here is in preparation. So how do you cut these pieces so thin? What's the thickness? Um, what knife do you use? For electron, yeah, for electron microscopes transmission, we need to have them below 100 nanometers, unless you have some tomography or etc. So I'm talking about 120 kV accelerated electrons or 80. And this is this ultra microtome. Yeah, I show the machine. It's, it's, um, it makes these little steps every time it brings the sample 80 nanometers closer. But the knife, the best what works is a diamond knife. And it's really, I think, just one or two atoms of diamond on top of the, the edge. So it's really a mechanical knife which it's is cutting. Me yeah, it's, yeah. And this was one of the tricks to develop these pre high precision machines. Nice. Yeah, diamond knives. Are, it's very expensive, but it, they're amazing. It's Japanese, no? <laughs> And of course, you can imagine it's never easy. It's not just cutting, then there's compression on the knife, then there's crevices, there's chatter. It's, it's Just a couple questions. Uh, because we have to cut the samples because of energy limitation or energy of the electrons. Yeah. Like, what if we have more energy? then we can avoid uh, cutting yes. them so thin, yeah. I mean. Then, exactly, then you can go higher. So for 300 kV microscopes, you can go to 300 nanometers, yeah? Um, also, the, the more acceleration will produce less, uh, will give you kind of less contrast. That's why biologists like low accelerated um, electrons. Um, but with this 300, then of course you will have a bigger projection, which that's why you have to do tomography, that um, you get back the resolution. Okay. Yeah, because the fixed section, if you image the fixed section, you will get a projection um, across this 300 nanometers, which will be a step backward. Uh, okay. So it's again this trade-off between, um, you know, that's what I forgot to mention, but when you do immunofluorescence on section, I said, um, I appreciate this very much. It really improves resolution in Z and in X, Y. Why is it, it improves it in Z? Because it's infinite. You're just labeling the surface. When we go with a confocal, we still image like 500 nanometers or even more. Yeah? And that will never be so sharp as uh, okay. just the surface labeling. Okay, thanks. So uh, I think after all these questions, if there is no more, um, I think we can conclude with the, the presentation and the question answer section. So uh, thank you very much, Urshka, for this good, pre nice presentation. And uh, yeah, thank you for all the questions. Huh? <laughs>